Siva is a former neighbor of ours in many, many capacities. So we lived prior to coming here in the same neighborhood and enjoyed his company and that of his family. And we also traveled the summer together on semester at sea, where he was teaching about global media studies as we, as we rocked on the Mediterranean. He's the author, author of The Googleization of Everything and Why We Should Worry. Um, in trying to figure out uh, what you would like to hear, I said, they kind of like something edgy, right? And so we decided that it was going to be about surveillance. Siva is uh, the chair of the Department of Media Studies. He's a professor there and also in the law school at UVA, and he is a Robertson professor. I am absolutely thrilled to have Thank our friend best. and an esteemed, esteemed, well-known faculty member and scholar. Please join me in welcoming you. Thank you. All right. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you today about two intersecting issues. One is big data, and the other is surveillance. Um, our current surveillance systems, the ones you've read so much about since June of 2013, mm -hmm. are functions of our capacity to collect large amounts of data, and an almost um, social, political, and economic imperative to collect large amounts of data just about any way we can um, in just about any form. Uh, and it's being collected by um, so many different companies with which we interact pretty regularly. Uh, and so that's sort of where I'm going to talk from. Uh, obviously, Google is a big part of my discussion. Um, I spent more than five years trying to make sense of that fast moving, fast growing, extremely rich and powerful company. But not so much about the company as much as our relationship with it um, and the effects that the <clears throat> increasing dependency that we have on Google uh, has had on our expectations, um, our, <clears throat> our, our sense of me making meaning in the world, uh, and our sense of what's important in the world. Uh, and, and so I, I tried to focus much more on us than on the company itself for a couple of reasons. One. Uh, it would be crazy to try to capture what goes on at a company like that uh, in the pages of a book. Uh, many have tried, some have done well, uh, but almost immediately you would imagine much of a book that was just about the company would be obsolete. Um, and, and to a significant degree, my book, which is now uh, three years old, is already obsolete. Uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't buy it, I encourage you to. <laughs> but, you will, you will immediately see that there was, there was just no way I could keep up on everything. But I tried to take a big picture. But what I didn't see was a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I, a lot of what I'm talking about today is stuff that we, those of us who study these things, um, smelled a few years ago, uh, sensed a few years ago, but couldn't quite articulate nor describe. And it really has been since June of 2013, since the initial releases, uh, by Edward Snowden and the journalists working with him, uh, that we've been able to get a much better picture of what exactly is happening when it comes to the level of data valence, the neologism of, of, that we use for talking about uh, the, the massive vacuuming of digital traces, and, um, and its role in more traditional surveillance, the tracking of individuals and groups and social networks and so forth. Um, so uh, let me start out with a movie clip. And hopefully the camera will be able to pick this up. It's kind of quiet. This is a movie called The Conversation. It was directed by Francis Ford Coppola. And it came out in 1974. That's John Cazale, better known as Fredo from the Godfather movies. <laughs> and Gene Hackman. Gene Hackman is playing a character named Harry Call. Harry Call is a fascinating character. If you haven't seen this movie, I really recommend it. I strongly recommend it. See it as soon as possible. So this is San Francisco, Union Square. Harry Call is in charge of this team of surveillance experts. They're specializing in audio surveillance, but they're also taking still photographs. This gentleman who's 
actual real actor name I forget, was in Apocalypse Now. He played Chef, if you're familiar with Apocalypse Now. So these women have no idea they're being watched. And the expressions, the behaviors, are certainly nothing they would do if they were being watched. And yet, immediately we move to Cindy Williams, better known as Shirley from Laverne and Shirley, suspecting that, in fact, she is being watched. Because there's a suspicious looking man with an earplug, long before earbuds were ubiquitous, of course. Now, that particular clip, occurs at the very beginning of the film. Sorry, this is what happens when you steal clips from YouTube. Um, the government's been in bed with the entire telecommunications industry since the 40s. They've infected everything. From get into your bank statements, computer files, or email, listen to your phone calls. My wife's been saying that for years. Every okay. wire, every area. Anyone know this movie? Mm. It's Enemy of the State, 1998. <laughs> Young, up and coming, unknown actor named William Smith. <laughs> and Gene Hackman, playing a different character, this one named Lyle. But in both cases, he's a surveillance expert. In both cases, being a surveillance expert, he's very concerned with living in what we would now call off the grid. That's classified. In the old days, we actually had to tap a wire to your phone line. Now, it calls bouncing off satellites, they snatch them right out of the air. Hackman's describing our current state of surveillance. He's actually describing the state of surveillance in 1998. He talks about how the telecommunication industry has been in bed with the National Security Agency for years. This is something that in 1998 was pretty much dismissed as science fiction. Um, and yet, this film itself goes into depth about the extent to which one's everyday activities are tracked, traced, and are potentially impeded by this level of surveillance. So again, 1998, three years before 9-11, four years before the Patriot Act, and four years before what we initially learned was a, a sort of a, an aborted program called Total Information Awareness that the Defense Department announced in the wake of the attacks of 9-11-2001. Uh, when the idea of total information awareness came out uh, soon after 9-11, um, there was pretty massive popular uproar against it. The idea was, and it's simple enough, that there are all these digital traces that we all leave when we use mobile phones, when we use landline phones, it creates a record, a record of who we called and when. Um, there are traces uh, of what sorts of products we buy because our credit card companies make huge collections of data, dossiers about us. And then there's actually a market for those dossiers filled in with data from Barnes & Noble, if you have a Barnes & Noble loyalty card, Harris Teeter, if you have a Harris Teeter loyalty card, Food Lion, if you have a Food Lion loyalty card, anything you buy at Amazon. All of these things, as early as 2002, were subject to um, the gathering into a large collection of databases that the Pentagon wanted to sift through. And this program, as I said, was called Total Information Awareness. That was the plan, that was the pledge at the time, uh, and both um, the general public and important members of Congress thought that this was an appalling vision. And the idea is that if we can collect all of this data about people, innocent people largely, we can crunch it. We can analyze it, we can sift through it, we can look for patterns. So over time, if you know that there are a handful of people who are up to no good, you can use these patterns to identify other people who might be up to no good. If there are certain behaviors that show up a lot, like if the class of people we know are who are planning to or have planned to do bad things, to blow people up, if those people tend to purchase particular kinds of airline tickets to particular destinations in the world at certain times of year, instead of having to identify the individuals first 
and then track their goings on. You can use the data to sift through and search for those sorts of patterns. If people who tend to want to do bad things uh, are willing to buy large amounts of fertilizer um, at a time of year when one would not necessarily need large amounts of fertilizer, that might be a warning sign. Now, we already had warning systems that would uh, alert law enforcement or national security officers if someone bought a large amount of fertilizer and people who sell fertilizer are basically told to take down records of people who buy large amounts of fertilizer because it can be made into pretty lethal bombs. Um, so we've had these systems that were much more targeted in the past. And for the most part, they've worked, but of course, occasionally they fail. Um, the Murrah Building uh, in Oklahoma City, uh, which um, uh, blew up in 1993, was an example of a case in which a domestic terrorist had purchased a large amount of fertilizer uh, and con con uh, constructed bombs um, totally undetected. Uh, in the wake of this bombing, though, which killed several hundred people, um, a system was imposed to track that sort of behavior. But to the, the people who were putting together total information awareness, this wasn't sufficient. Uh, we needed earlier warning. We needed warning about groups we might not be tracking, individuals we might not have identified before. And so the system was proposed, and Congress immediately shut it down basically prevented the Defense Department from doing this. So what we find out later is that this very idea that the government should collect large amounts of data from private uh, data gathering services, either by purchasing or just grabbing it, uh, that went into the variety of programs that we've learned about since June that Edward Snowden has, uh, has released uh, information about uh, in these documents. Now, why did I show these two movie clips? Well, not just that they're two really great movies, uh, and not just because Gene Hackman is an amazing actor who always seems to be about 49 years old, no matter how old he really is. And actually, in, in the conversation, he was pretty young. Uh, he was a young, up-and-coming method actor, New York stage trained, actually trained at the Actors uh, Studio. He had... Um, he was Dustin Hoffman's roommate in New York before he moved to Hollywood in the late 60s. This was one of his first major film roles in which he got to carry a movie. Um, the Conversation was also a really important movie in Coppola's career. It was the movie he really wanted to make uh, more than any other movie. He had contracted to uh, do The Godfather right after he had done, had a pretty big hit with American Graffiti. Uh, and Paramount really wanted him to do The Godfather 2. He wasn't interested in doing The Godfather 2. He didn't really like working with Mario Puzo that much. He didn't like the, that Puzo wrote the script. He was you know, when he did it, he made a masterpiece, of course, but his deal with Paramount was that he would only do Godfather II if they funded and helped him make um, the conversation, his real labor of love. The conversation came out in 1974. Does anybody younger than 50 remember what happened in 1974? Yeah. Nixon resigned. Exactly. Nixon resigned the same year, August 9th, in fact, 1974. August 9th is my anniversary. We didn't plan it that way. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, yeah. Nixon resigns in 1974 after basically two years of continuous revelations uh, about the extent to which he harnessed the powers of the federal government to spy on civilians, mostly his political enemies. And so we started in those two years, right up until 1974, becoming, becoming acutely aware of the extent to which our government had engaged in improper and illegal surveillance of American citizens. There had been a series of revelations up until then. We actually learned more after 1974 about this, by the way, uh, because in the late 70s, uh, the Senate started an investigation of what the CIA had done uh, and what the FBI had done domestically. Uh, and uh, the, it was known as the Church Committee. And we ended up finding out about things, for instance, that Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. had been uh, spied upon rather intimately for basically his entire public life. Um, that J. Edgar Hoover had had him trailed and had his phones bugged and had extensive, almost hour-by-hour hour notes uh, for everything that Dr. King did. And of course, when Americans found out about this, we were appalled uh, and we said never again. And so Congress in the 1970s passed a series of very important laws that were meant to limit the government's ability to track us, um, to give us some sense of, of uh, reciprocity and accountability with our government. The principle then, which doesn't sound crazy in a republic, is that we should know as much about our government as our government knows about us. 
Now, that doesn't mean that we should know everything about our government, nor does it mean that our government should know everything about us. But there should be some sort of reciprocity, otherwise we are merely subjects and not citizens. This wasn't a crazy idea in the 1970s, and yet we hardly ever hear that articulated now. And one of the reasons that we don't hear it articulated now is we've become so inured by this. We've become so overwhelmed by the ways in which we are asked to submit to surveillance. And in many ways, we're being asked to submit to surveillance uh, systems that we are not completely aware of, not completely engaged with. This is a definition of big data. Don't read it. It's, <laughs> it's way too many words. Right? But, and this, I, I pulled this from a computer science uh, um, uh, journal, and it's a pretty good definition of big data. Basically, it just means a lot of data here, right? The, and, uh, but it talks about the fact that uh, the collection of data and the algorithms used to analyze data have to be big enough and sophisticated enough to yield real insight. Now, here's a cleaner definition. Uh, this is from a book called Big Data, A Revolution That Will Transform How We Live, Work, and Think. Uh, it was written by uh, Victor Meyer Schoenberger, who is a scholar at the Oxford Internet Institute, uh, and Kenneth Kukier, who is a writer for The Economist magazine. Um, and this is not just a definition, but it's kind of a, 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 a boast, right? Big data refers to things that one can do at a large scale that cannot be done at a smaller one to extract new insights or create new forms of value. So that's a much simpler um, uh, sense of what big data is all about. Now here is the boast. The benefits to society may, will, will be myriad. Anytime you see someone writing about technology who says something will happen, you should immediately be suspicious. Um, how do they know what will happen, right? Um, uh, but of course, benefits always will happen. Occasionally we see costs that will happen, but most of the time, they're trying to sell you something. They're trying to sell you a vision uh, of a very different future. And those who read this book will be in a position to uh, leverage the information to win the future. And those who don't read this book won't. That's the principle behind so many of these books about what's coming or what should be coming or what will be coming. Uh, as big data becomes part of the solution to pressing global problems like addressing climate change, eradicating disease, and fostering good governance and economic development sounds great, doesn't it? Well, it turns out the promise of big data is not so simple. We know some of the big costs of big data. We know some of the big costs, like the fact that we are subject to being treated as means instead of ends by our government and by companies. We shouldn't expect anything else from companies. That's what we're here for, for them, and that's what they're here for. But we should have a different relationship with our government. But this idea here is that the collection of data in large sets and the analysis of it um, in sophisticated ways can give us insight into the world, the world of commerce, the world of human behavior, the world of the natural sciences. Um, and that insight will be so powerful that it can radically improve our standard of living. That's the promise that we are being sold. Unfortunately, it's not actually true. It's not actually true because the data itself is only as good as its sources. And no matter how much data you have, the key is how one sorts through it. And so instead of having a rich, sophisticated discussion of how we might create systems that can actually um, uh, generate positive externalities from this large collection of data that's going on all around us and avoiding the negative, we are dealing with utopia and dystopia in almost all of our conversations. Now, fortunately, we have here at UVA a very different conversation going on. Um, we have a big initiative to uh, invest in what's known as the data sciences, um, largely in the natural sciences, but also in medicine and in the social sciences, and, and to a little degree, a small degree, in the humanities. So we're investing in new infrastructure. We're investing in the development of homegrown algorithms to analyze large collections of text, large collections of voter records, large collections of medical records, um, large collections of radio signals from outer space. There are lots of cool ways that we're expanding our capacity to examine large sets of data. But along with that, in the UVA way, we're also developing a strong conversation married to the scientific investigations 
that will focus on the law, policy, and ethical implications of big data. So that's what's happening here at UVA, largely because we see so many cases and so many ways that big data is being misused or abused in a lot of different areas of life. Now again, I opened up with those two movies because those two movies are set, or basically they were released 24 years apart. In that 24 year period, we encounter a very different ecosystem, a very different ecosystem of, uh, of consumer behavior, of tracking, a very different ecosystem of national security and a very different set of expectations. In the conversation set in 1974, we get to see, and again, I highly recommend you watch this movie, we get to see that surveillance is really powerful if it's targeted at particular people. All the tools that they use are analog, cameras, tape, etc. But within these, uh, despite all of the use of merely analog tools, they are really powerful and really precise, but that you already have to know who you're going after. By 1998, it's wide open. By 1998, you don't have to know who you're going after because all the data is being vacuumed up by the government and all they have to do is run a few searches and start messing with your life. And what happens, what unfolds in Enemy of the State is that Will Smith inadvertently comes into possession of a video that implicates some very bad people in a very bad crime. I don't want to give too much away. But this video, which was taken surreptitiously through a surveillance camera, actually, weirdly enough, um, ends up making Will Smith's character the target of NSA retribution. Uh, and quickly he finds that his credit cards don't work. Quickly he finds that um, he has electronic um, bugs all over his clothes and his shoes. Quickly he finds that his phone gives away his location, something that doesn't surprise us now, but certainly was a revelation in 1998 when our phones didn't have GPS chips in them in a ubiquitous way. So all of that is related in this movie set in 1998, and it's, it's terrifically poignant. It's also a really fun movie with a lot of chase scenes and stuff. So, it's, you know, it's a Tony Scott film. You, uh, you, you can't lose there. Um, now, where are we now? And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to keep this to the, uh, uh, to the uh, apportioned uh, uh, time so we can have more time to converse rather than listen to me talk about it. What we have now is a system that we've rushed into. A system we haven't as citizens or even consumers invited upon us, yet one that just seemed to happen. It happened because there was an imperative. There was an imperative from these companies that these companies learned long ago that if they collect large amounts of data, they can figure out the techniques to sort through this data and effectively target us for marketing. And that makes a lot of sense. Because in the old days, there were two strategies for targeting for marketing. One was try to hit as many people as you can with your message and hope that some of it sticks. This is what Budweiser does or Miller Beer does on a Sunday. Um, Ford will do it by buying commercials on a Sunday during football because a good portion of Americans are watching football on a Sunday. And if you roll the commercials out there, enough people will be inspired to drink Budweiser that it'll make it all worth it, or less. That was what the leap of faith brought them to. Um, and the other way was to segment the market, but we could only segment markets in really um, clumsy ways. We would do it by zip code, we would do it by ethnicity, we would do it by gender, uh, and those always missed the mark because, of course, people are far more interesting than that, than those categories. Uh, and uh, that often was futile or frustrating or backfired in terms of marketing. But if we could get people to express their niches, if we get, get people to be themselves and show who they align with, show who they share passions with, if they could reveal those collaborations and connections, then, then marketing can become really interesting. Because instead of saying, African-American people who live in cities will listen to the following 40 songs and love them. And we're going to create a radio station that focuses on this. And um, white people who live in the suburbs are going to listen to these 40 songs and we're going to create a radio station focused on this. Instead, 
you can actually ignore those large clumsy categories and figure out what people who like song A are likely also to like in other areas of life, regardless of those other tags, as we would call them now, tags of identity. Because you can trace connections, um, knowing that there are going to be significant people in both communities who have very different musical tastes, but also that their musical tastes might indicate a desire to drive a particular kind of car, drink a kind of beer, drink a kind of coffee. All of those other ways that we can create profiles are much more interesting and exact. So this revolution in marketing started about 20 years ago with the ability to create large data sets, track, trace, connect, um, sift through patterns. And it's been fairly effective. It's been fairly effective. Sometimes it's off. This is fundamentally how Google puts ads uh, targeted towards you. Google knows a lot about you and tries to, uh, when it posts ads next to your search results, it tries its best to understand and predict what you might be interested in based on where you live, based on what it knows about you. More importantly, what it knows people who have also searched for these terms also are interested in, right? It knows your click history, it knows your search history, but it knows everything about everybody else like you. Uh, and that's one of the reasons it's so successful at placing these ads, and it's one of the reasons it makes many billions of dollars. Facebook is doing the same thing, but not as successfully, because the people who work at Facebook haven't been up to it as long. Um, they're actually, even though they're dealing with a richer set of signals about our preferences, because we like stuff, uh, for some reason they haven't cracked their own code when it comes to ad placement. They're getting better at it, but they're not completely successful. So what we have now is a system of surveillance, both on the private sector side and the public sector side, that is largely invisible. We're not supposed to know that about Google. We're not supposed to know that about Facebook. Facebook and Google don't lie to us about it. They don't necessarily conceal it, but they don't reveal it either. You have to click pretty deep in the about sections of both these pages to understand what each company is doing with all of our <coughs> records of activities. Barnes & Noble will tell you what it's going to do with the data when you sign up for that discount card, which you probably signed up for 10 years ago, if you read the small print of the piece of paper they put in front of you when you signed or clicked online, but nobody ever does that. Apple will, it tells you what it does with its data every time you sign up for iTunes, but of course you didn't read that and neither did I. Actually, I did because it's kind of my job, but let's pretend I didn't. <laughs> uh, but it's long. It's like the latest user agreement for iTunes is something like 50 pages. Um, if you print it out, nobody reads this thing except a handful of people who have to. Um, and yet, in it, that's their disclosure. This is what we do. So it's disclosure that's not really disclosure. This is what I call the cryptopticon. These are methods of surveillance that are essentially invisible. They're cryptic. They're methods of surveillance that are not meant to make us think I'm being watched or make us be particularly worried about the nature of the watching. Now, you can say, being educated, technologically sophisticated people, yeah, I knew that. I, I kind of got that. We, you know, I've talked about it. We talked about it when, we, you know, when, when I signed up for Facebook. My family and I talked about it, that kind of stuff, right? But the fact is most people don't think about it. Most people don't have a way into it. Uh, most people don't have a reason to be concerned. And the surveillance doesn't just happen on Facebook, where it's kind of more obvious than in other places. But the fact that... Um, uh, the fact that Barnes & Noble and Harris Teeter and any number of other organizations and, uh, uh, and companies that ask for any information about you are creating dossiers that they then sell to companies like ChoicePoint, a really wealthy, successful company that creates marketing dossiers for other companies. The fact that that invisible economy is happening is not obvious to us. Now, the government, of course, law enforcement, depends on this same data, cryptically. There was a time when the model for surveillance was the panopticon, as Michel Foucault described in his book, Discipline and Punish, and as Jeremy Bentham described as a potential model for prisons. The idea was that um, if you know you're being watched, or you at least assume you're being watched, you're going to behave. You're going to snap to attention. You're not going to misbehave. You're not going to push the limits of social behavior because I'm being watched. So you saw in the clip from the conversation, those two women putting on lipstick and sort of mugging for the mirrors, something they would not do if they knew there were two creepy men watching them, right? So the idea of the panopticon is, if you know that creepy men are watching you, 
you're not going to do something that, that you might otherwise do in a relaxed environment. Well, the cryptopticon is actually that one-way mirror. The cryptopticon is a system of surveillance in which people are willing to loosen up, mug, um, put lipstick on, be themselves, do their own thing, um, organize themselves into niche groups, either for consumption or for hobbies or fetishes or anything else, mm. right? And, and, and be tracked. Because the, it's the opposite idea of the panopticon. The panopticon is supposed to be a system of social control. And one of the arguments I make, I have a paper that's coming out about this stuff, is that the panopticon is no longer a useful model for describing surveillance in society. We have panopticon type stuff all around. Whenever you walk into a convenience store and it says, you know, basically you're under surveillance, that's supposed to be a panopticon idea. You're supposed to see that and say, well, I better not rob this place or take my clothes off, right? It's a bad idea. Um, and if you walk around London or New York City or Washington DC, you see cameras. They're not hidden. They're pretty ubiquitous. And the principle there is, you know you're being watched. Don't blow anything up. OK, that might work. It might not work. Foucault argued that that actually prevents us from dressing weirdly and behaving weirdly and imagining different roles in society or imagining a completely different social system or political system or economic system that limits imagination because it, it makes us um, cohere and adhere to certain standards. I'm not sure that's right. I'm actually pretty sure it's not right. But what I do know is that the hidden structures of surveillance encourage us to do our own thing. As the eyes of the brother say, say it's your thing. Do what you want to do. Right, Brian? See, I had to give him one. I had to give him one. We had this thing going all summer, by the way, where I was lecturing in my global media class at, on Semester at Sea, and Brian was sitting in the back. And uh, um, I would make cultural references that would zoom over the heads of the students, and Brian would snatch them. So, yeah, so, so basically what the government wants is exactly what Amazon wants, is exactly what Barnes & Noble wants, is exactly what Facebook wants, and that is for you to be yourself, to align yourself with like-minded people so that they can efficiently target goods and services, or in the case of the government, they can track your social and political connections with remarkable accuracy. That's the goal, and it is going to require a very different set of creative strategies, political strategies, and theories to address this new environment of surveillance. So it's the cryptopticon, not the panopticon. Next time someone says surveillance like panopticon, you can say, wait, I know a different model. Anyway, thanks for your time. You want to talk some more? No? You want to eat? OK. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Appreciate it. <laughs> cool. We can have some more informal conversations. Yeah, let's be informal. Dumplings and we can chat and circulate. Let's talk over dumplings. Thank you. Okay.